Bach and Sun Park from UC Berkeley to talk about machine learning for image manipulation. The Sun is a PhD student at UC Berkeley, uh, where he's advised by Professor Leo Sharefros, and he focuses on computer vision and learning based computational photography. Prior to that, he received his bachelor and master at Stanford, where he worked with Vladimir Colton and Sergey Lepin. Uh, throughout his PhD, uh, the Sun has worked on really exciting and successful projects uh, relating to image synthesis, including the super well known Cycle GAN with more than 5,000 citations, uh, or Gao GAN, which uh, got a Best Paper Finalist Award at CPR19 and a Best uh, Show Award at CGRAF19 in real time. Uh, for his work, uh, the Sun is the recipient of the Samsung Scholarship and the Adobe Research Fellowship in 2020. The Sun, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. It's my honor to give a talk at MIT, probably the best university in the world, next to Berkeley. <laughs> um, I just hope that I could visit uh, physically just to you know enjoy Boston, but too bad that's not happening this year. So I'm going to have to remotely meet you. And you can see a more realistic version of myself, not this uh, webcam version, who just woke up 20 minutes ago um, in this photo. And that's my wife in the back. Uh, we got married last year. Thank you. <laughs> it has been a relatively happy work from home year. Um, I'm going to begin by saying that I'm a hobbyist photographer. I like taking landscape photos. And here are some photos that I took. This is Berkeley campus. Uh, we have a very nice view of San Francisco and the Bay. And this is springtime in Bay Area, uh, very warm. And this is Venice, Italy during ICCV 2017. I like my photos to have vibrant colors, but of course it's not always easy. For example, this photo was taken a few months months ago when the wildfire smoke made the back mountain look hazy, but I put that photo on Photoshop and play with contrast and color. And there you go. It looks much more vibrant. However, I still wish I could do more with it. Maybe in Photoshop, uh, I can increase brightness and contrast, but I wouldn't be able to do bigger edits like changing time of day or changing the season. And let me tell you why these edits are not possible with Photoshop. It's pretty simple. It's because the output can only be generated using the pixels of the input image. But if you want to add snow to the input image, you must have seen that snow pixels from somewhere. And that somewhere is clearly not the input image. This is exactly where machine learning can come into play we can gain generic visual knowledge from a data set and use that for creating new realistic visual that is nowhere present in the input image. So let's think about how to approach using machine learning for creating new images. Well, I'm sure most people will think about GANs. GANs work by randomly sampling a latent Z vector and transforming it to a realistic image. The realism is enforced by I think everyone knows, simultaneously training a discriminator that determines if the generated image looks realistic or not. One interesting point is that GANs are like a random image generator. If I want to edit my own face, I should first find the corresponding latent vector that'll reproduce my photo. But it's not always an easy thing to do. I can perform test time optimization in the latent space so that the output matches my photo, but it's too slow and imperfect. Here's another example of trying to reconstruct an outdoor image. The two buildings are totally different. For the purpose of image editing, there's really no reason that the output images should be generated from randomly drawn numbers. So instead, my generator for image editing will begin with the input image. Then from an external data set, I hope to learn some way to blend in the pixels of the input image with the visual knowledge extracted from the data set. Of course, this is not an easy thing to do. You train a neural network on the training set and at test time, it should work well with the user provided test image. So in a sense, this is a typical machine learning problem of training and test discrepancy generalization. 
But it's not only that. If you take too much from the data set, then you're ignoring the input image and we're kind of back to a random image generation. On the other hand, you take too much from the input image, then you're not making meaningful edits to the image. So there is an inherent conflict between the input and the data set. For this scenario, our model needs to disentangle the notion of snow from its geometry and apply to the structure of the input image. My works primarily focus on solving this conflict. Then let's begin by thinking about what would be the most straightforward way to learn this disentanglement. Well, we have our model directly learn from examples of input output pairs created with human annotation. It's surely going to be expensive to prepare such a data set, but we don't need to be so clever about figuring out the nature of this entanglement in the architecture or the formulation of our model. Here's one useful approach uh, uh, that is a nice application of this concept. In this setting, the input image contains layout of the scene along with the material type at each region. Then the output image should be a photorealistic image that follows the input layout. Clearly, the input layout does not contain any pixels that look photorealistic. Therefore, it must be learned from the data set during training. So here's our method for training such a model. Given an input image from the training set and the uh, output of our model, we compare it with the ground truth photo and optimize our model to match that photo. On top of that, we'll use the adversarial laws to enhance photorealism. We train our model on a large data set of paired examples. Given a photograph, we use human annotation to draw the layout of each photo. Our model is trained to do the inverse operation going from layout to photo. So let's look at the results of such approach. There is an existing works named uh, PixelPix and its follow-up PixelPix HD that uses this formulation. Given these input layouts of the Cityscapes dataset, we get these results. It produces quite realistic outputs. However, on more challenging data set, we found that the results become quite bad compared to the real photographs. The new data set contains more than 150 labels instead of just 20 labels of the Cityscapes data set. It seemed mysterious that the outputs don't achieve photorealism at all. So I began debugging this. As the simplest case, I created some toy layouts where all pixels belong to the same sky class. And I pass it to the trained network of PixelPix HD. And very surprisingly, I get a gray image, which means uh, I got zeros everywhere. Mm. Exactly the same thing happened with another toy layout of grass label. I also get zeros everywhere. It almost looked like the model is just ignoring the input and just outputting zeros. Why is this happening? After some investigation or after many hours of investigation, I found that the issue was in the architecture. A standard deep network consists of convolutional layers followed by normalization layers, which works by making each layer output zero mean and unit variance. We know normalization yields nice properties for image recognition, such as smoother gradient flow or invariance to input scaling. However, normalization causes too much invariance if the input is uniform. It's because the output of convolution is also going to be uniform. And after normalization, everything just becomes zero. In other words, the input signal is completely lost in the middle of the network. Therefore, I started a simple fix by just providing the input over and over after every normalization layer of the generator network. And by doing so, I could actually get the correct textures for these uniform layouts. This is um, basically what I did, but uh, I used a little bit different or fancier architecture to implement this. So let's take a look at uh, how we provided this input signal. After normalization, we try to 
undo the harm by modulating the normalized activations by readjusting the mean and variance based on the input layout. This modulation is implemented with a few convolutional layers, and we named this module spatially adaptive denormalization, or SPADE in short. In the end, we could achieve much better realism than the previous method. Using Spade, we built a fun UI and presented it as SIGGRAPH. Basically, it looked like the Microsoft Paint app, but instead of the color palette, we provide semantic palette of material types like ocean, sky, rock, and sand. Our app generates photorealistic images with the appearance of the photographs, but respecting the user drawn layout. Lastly, note that there exist multiple plausible images that match the input. It would be nice if we can control the style of the output. And to do this, we added some stochasticity to the network by starting with a random vector sampled from Gaussian, similar to standard GANs. Moreover, we additionally train an encoder network to capture the style of a reference image into the latent space. We also incorporated this feature into our UI. In the end, thanks to the paired supervision, our model achieves disentanglement of layout and appearance, along with controllability of style, as well as high photorealism, like the reflection of the tree on the water. Now, let's take a step back and think about how useful this approach would be. Remember, training this model required preparing ground truth pairs. What if we want to transform horses to zebras? We can collect a bunch of horse photos and zebra photos, but we wouldn't be able to collect ground truth pairs with a horse and zebra posing exactly the same way in exactly same background. We can still throw in the GAN laws, but the discriminator will be happy as long as the output looks like any zebra unrelated to the input. Therefore, in addition to the adversarial laws, we need another constraint. To that end, we propose the cycle consistency constraint. We jointly train another image translation model in the reverse direction, and we enforce that the output zebra is back translated to the original horse. In more detail, given an input horse image, we first apply mapping, forward mapping to translate into the zebra domain. Then we apply inverse mapping to reconstruct the input horse image. And we simultaneously optimize uh, this forward and inverse mapping to minimize the reconstruction error. This can help solving the correspondence problem because for the correct translation, the back translation has a small cycle loss while for incorrect translations, the cycle loss is going to be large. So this is the result of our method cycle again. One advantage about cycle again is that it's relatively easy to train the model. And that's just because you just need to collect photos from two domains. And this can be simply done by searching, uh, crawling photos from Google image search. We can also apply cycle again to style transfer applications. And unlike previous uh, single image style transfer method, we learned the style from all of the artist paintings. We were also the first to do the opposite mapping going from a painting to a photo. Cycle again can also be used for data augmentation for autonomous driving applications like changing uh, time of day, day to night, here, individual frames are trans translated separately, so you can see some flickering here. We can also turn real driving scenes into the style of computer graphics. Especially, CycleGAN can be used for domain adaptation. Let's say the goal is to train a semantic segmentation model you can prepare a data set of RGB images and their segmentation maps. Then you get 93% accuracy in doing so. But the cost of human annotation will be very high. 
it may not generalize to rare scenarios. So you can reduce the cost by training your model in computer graphics where segmentation can be auto-generated. However, because of the domain gap, the accuracy drops considerably from 93 to 54. To reduce the domain gap, we can train a segmentation model on the stylized images to match the target data set using cycle again. And this approach improves the accuracy to 83% which was the state of the art at the time of study. Moreover, domain adaptation is not the only application of CycleGen. It can be used in many different applications ranging from object editing, font transfer, data generation of license plates, or photo, en photo enhancement like uh, image dehazing. It has also been used in other research fields like medical imaging, uh, voice conversion, or even cracking simple ciphers. I think CycleGen had an advantage of not requiring paired supervision with a loss function that can be generalized to other domains, but it's not perfect. For one thing, four networks need to be trained, which makes it quite computationally heavy to use in conjunction with other models. Also, the cycle consistency loss is sometimes too constraining. And let me tell you in detail what this really means. Cycle loss is designed to promote sensible translation. And by sensible, I mean the translated zebra should retain some resemblance to the horse image. To achieve this, an inverse translation function is learned at the same time to minimize pixel cycle loss. Of course, the back translation should be penalized if the pose becomes different. However, there are actually many plausible horses that may correspond to the same zebra. Once the horse is transformed into a zebra, the color information of the horse is lost. Therefore, it shouldn't really matter which color the back translated horse becomes. For example, a head should remain as a head and feet should remain as feet as long as a head does not become a foot. That's really all we need. So let's directly implement this idea as a loss function. First of all, we use a GAN discriminator to make the output look like a zebra, but we need to make sure that the structure is preserved. To do this, we consider a pair of input and output patch at the same location and enforce that the embeddings of the pair are similar. On the other hand, the patches from other locations should be mapped far from them. We formulate this as a contrastive loss the corresponding input and output patches form a positive pair. Patches from other locations form negative pairs. In more detail, we use cosine similarities. We maximize the similarity of the positive pair while minimizing that of the negative pairs. We do this by formulating a classification task with the target class as the positive pair. This formulation is called info NCE, was introduced and used in several orgs and representation learning. However, unlike MoCo and SimClear that used hand-designed data augmentation to produce positive pairs, we use the outputs of the generator that's learned at the same time. To project the patches into the embedding space, we use the first half of the generator as our encoder and we found that computing the contrastive loss at multiple layers is important for stable training. In the end, our method replaces the fixed pixel-based cycle loss. Moreover, our method doesn't require a generator or discriminator in the inverse direction. And because of this, our method can be trained faster than cycle again with a smaller memory footprint. And this is going to be helpful when an image translation model is trained jointly with other models in a larger context, like domain adaptation or sim to real in robotics test tests. Also, interestingly, we observed that the choice of negative patches is important. By default, we only sample the negatives from the same image, which we call internal patches. On the other hand, we can also include random patches from other images as additional negatives, which we call external patches. In representation learning, 
it's known that a large number of external negatives improve performance. Instead, here we work at the patch level, so we can use the same image as the source of our negatives. Indeed, when we tried to use external patches as additional negatives, the output quality was actually worse. And we hypothesized that it's because the external patches are too easy to distinguish, and they sometimes contain false negatives like the highlighted horse head patch. In fact, the power of internal patches has been well known in classic texture synthesis work. And more recently, training a super resolution network on the same but downsampled image was shown to achieve competitive performance to other methods trained on the entire data set. And just like this, our model fully leverages the internal statistics of a single input image. So here's a visual comparison of using internal versus external patches. Compared to our default method, using the external patches causes more artifacts and signs of mode collapse. Also, we found that the samples from the target domain can be used for regularization following the identity loss used in CycleGAN. Normally, we compute the contrastive loss using an image from the source domain which is horse in this figure. But additionally, we can provide a zebra image from the target domain as an input to the generator network. And we still enforce the same contrastive loss to prevent making unnecessary changes to the input images. So in our final model named cut, short for contrastive unpaired translation, we use the identity regularization as well as the contrastive loss. As opposed to the pixel cycle loss, our loss is more flexible yet faster than cycle again. Actually, our method can be made even faster by not using the identity regularization, but using a larger weight on the contrastive loss. So here we show the training speed of our method compared to cycle again. And note that we use the same network and can loss. The only difference is the contrastive versus pixel cycle loss. We compare to uh, other methods, our speed, our speed is much better than two-sided methods and on par with one-sided methods. Here are the visual examples. It can be seen that cut is able to make larger changes than cycle again, such as putting large zebra texture here our method also performs well compared to more recent models. And lastly, fast cut due to larger contrastive loss behaves more conservatively and hence more similar to cycle again. And here, what do I exactly mean by more conservative transformation? So because I have been looking at these horses and zebra photos for the entire uh, years of my grad school, I found an interesting bias in the horse to zebra data set. Using an off-the-shelf semantic segmentation network, we found that zebra uh, pixels take up more than twice the horse pixels. And I truly believe this is just a bias of the photographer in ImageNet, because uh, when you take a photo of zebra, you want to emphasize the stripe pattern of the zebra body. So you end up kind of zooming in more when you, than when you take photos of horses. And Let's just accept that this is the case. If this is the case, should the output zebras match the pixel frequency of the target or the source data set? I think this is actually just a matter of personal taste or what you really want in your image translation. In the more flexible cut model, we match the target zebra pixel frequency. So if you carefully observe the highlighted portion, you'll see that the cut model actually enlarges the horse body. In the more conservative fast cut model, we better match the source, generating less zebra pixels. Still, both cut and fast cut make more changes than cycle again, which could lead to more artifacts in the background in doing so. <laughs> but after all, uh, these change, uh, differences are not very big. And just like cycle again, our default cut model can be used on various image-to-image -image translation datasets. 
One way to quantitatively evaluate the quality of results is using FID. It shows that our method is more powerful in distribution matching. We also measure the segmentation score on the Cityscapes dataset. So we first train an unpaired image translation model from semantic layouts to photographs. Then we use a pre-trained segmentation network to predict the semantic class of each pixel. If the output images are realistic, the predicted segmentation should match the original layout. And we just measure how much the prediction agrees with the input. The results show that cut can find ground truth correspondences better than existing methods. And lastly, since our contrastive loss only uses internal patches from the same image, we can even apply our method on single image datasets. Here we take a high res uh, painting of Cloud Monet and translate the image into the style of this one target photograph. And we use a patch discriminator. And this setting connects image to image translation to image stylization method. So here's a famous painting by Monet. Using this reference photo, we first compare to uh, st existing stylization method to turn this painting into a photograph. But stylization methods uh, are usually not designed for transforming paintings to photos. And you can see that the result is not very good. Here's uh, another method called the struts. And here's another method. And this is our result. And you can see that it actually keeps the structure of the input painting while having a photorealistic style of the reference photo. We also tried a patch version of CycleGen with pixel cycle consistency loss, but it produced more artifacts. Here's our result on Monet's water lilies. So let me summarize my works in the context of learning disentanglement. First, spade was the easiest setting for learning disentanglement because the paired data set directly suggested what the structure of the output should be. And then we discussed the problem of unpaired translation where we replaced paired supervision with domain supervision. We introduced the cycle, con cycle consistency loss to separate style from the structure of the image. And let's take one step further and discard the domain supervision as well. Within a collection of images, without any labels, can we still learn a meaningful disentanglement or image editing? And this is my latest work presented at NeurIPS last night. Let's begin by contemplating what is the information that should remain unchanged after image translation? We talked about uh, this is, uh, we, talk, we actually talked about this in a previous slide. We just mean that a head should still be a head. In other words, the structure is the representation that is invariant to changes in style across images. On the other hand, Style can be viewed as the information that stays invariant within the image, like the zebra stripe pattern here, but it should be distinct between images. So our definition of this within image and cross image variation can be compared to the content and style definition used by Munit, Drit, and Funit. The similarity is that our method also does something similar to content and style disentanglement of these papers, but the difference is that style is defined by domain label supervision in their works. So let's directly model this definition of style in our image manipulation model. Given an input image, we want to stylize that using a reference image to produce some output. How can we check the output captures the given style? We can take random patches from the style image and test if the output patch looks indistinguishable. In this case, the output patch clearly stands out from the others, so the stylization was incorrect. But in this case, the patches are indistinguishable, so the stylization is correct. So what do I exactly mean by style? 
Style is, I think, a quite general and overused term. Our way of defining style goes back in a little bit of history and is motivated by the finding of Bella Eulish, an experimental psychologist. He did many studies on how humans can distinguish texture. For example, in this image, I think you immediately see that there are two patterns. However, in this image, the distinction is not as clear. But magically, once you blur the pattern, you see the two different patterns. And after many of these uh, fascinating studies, he concludes that texture discrimination in human perception works by first extracting basic local features and then performing pairwise comparison of these features to tell if the patterns are the same. In other words, we should be able to set up a pairwise comparison test to see if the two patterns are the same texture. So let's do the test for ourselves. Let's take a data set of outdoor church images, Elson data set, and uh, let's consider two random crops from the same uh, from this data set. Do they look like they are coming from the same image? Well, I think the answer is no, it's not too hard. And what about these two? Yes, they are from the same image. And these two from different images. But if we stylize this image, you see it becomes much harder to answer. And we introduce a new adversarial training that exactly does this. So here's a full description of our method. First, our image manipulation model is modeled as an autoencoder, but unlike standard autoencoders, our encoder outputs two codes designed to represent structure and texture. And these two codes should have enough information to reconstruct the input image. And during training, we randomly sample another image, extract its codes, and do code swapping to produce a hybrid image. And we then take a random crop from the hybrid image and compare it to the random crops of the input image. We train a patch-based co-occurrence discriminator that tells if these patches are all from the same image. In conclusion, our method learns the disentanglement of structure and texture. And note that this like uh, swapping structure and texture swapping grid looks similar to the style content swapping grid of the style gen paper, but it's different in that the input images are actually existing real images. So if you look at uh, the top images, you can see that they are actually existing images. You may recognize these images. It's Notre Dame uh, de Paris. And then the next one is Sagrada Familiar in Barcelona. And you know, the the, uh, the task of extracting or disentangling what texture and structure is from these existing images is actually a non-trivial problem. And this is the result on the Elson bedroom data set. And you can see that the unique pattern of the style images are transferred. And because our method is an autoencoder, embedding input images is just one feed forward pass of the encoder network. The reconstructed images are accurate because our structure code retains spatial resolution. And here are the results of standard uh, unconditional GAN based approaches. The reconstruction quality is worse and they are also too slow for interactive image editing. Our quality of swapping is also better than existing method. The standard GAN based method produce unrealistic images and the stylization methods also don't look as good as ours. But what's more interesting to me about uh, this work is that the embedding space is smooth, allowing vector arithmetic. If we collect 10 images of Summer Mountain on Google, we encode these images and average the codes, we somehow get, kind of magically get the code representing Summer Mountains. And we can do the same thing on snowy mountains. If we take the difference of the two, we get a vector that'll add snow to the other images. So these are user provided input images like picture of Yosemite and adding this vector as snow to these images 
and subtracting that vector removes snow. If collecting 10 images is too much of a hassle, then we can just run PCA on the cores of the training set, similar to the idea of GAN space that came out earlier this year. And we found that the first principal components are all meaningful edit vectors. Our method can perform smooth interpolation of high resolution images. It can change things like weather condition, vegetation, season, color saturation, and many other things. Moreover, we built an interactive UI that lets you upload your own photos and begin editing. On the right side, you see previews of mini plating with the first 10 principal components in either positive or negative directions. And you can see that there are all reasonable edits. Furthermore, now that we have this entanglement of structure and style, we can separately edit the structure of the image while maintaining the the style of the image. For example, you can change the mountain line, like the boundary between mountain and sky, and or change the river to make a full circle. And these are results of directly editing the structure code by simply cloning the code from other parts of the image. Our method can also do domain translation if we combine different domains as one large data set. And using the UI, the user can control the output style, and this just often results in superior quality. On the faces, because we have this nice data set of landmark aligned, uh, we can run PCA on the flattened structure code to do spatial editing. I like landscape photos, and I'm very happy to see that my model can perform new types of image editing. I also wanted to very briefly share my thoughts about my next project. Because um, our model is not required to learn about the underlying 3D structure of the scene, our model tends to make modifications to the structure. So you see these uh, three leaves are growing and shrinking, although the goal of this manipulation is changing day to night. And that's just because there's correlation between astrophotos, like photos of night sky, and the amount of sky. If it's a photo of night stars, photos tend to show more sky because I think the photographer just tends to point more upwards toward the sky. So our model reduces the size of the ground. As a result, the underlying scene structure ends up changing a little bit. One way to prevent this is to utilize some knowledge about 3D or physics. We can have our encoder also output some physics-based representation and enforce that the representation is consistent after some modification like viewpoint changes. Now, the encoder is almost like 3D computer vision problem, basically. And um, this is going to be, I guess, quite hard problem. And on the other hand, the decoder is like a computer graphics pipeline. But um, I think this year there have been interesting feature representations that seem useful for my purpose. So there's Hologan and NERF and all the follow-up of NERF paper uh, in uh, CBPR submission this year. And also I think 2.5D representations, like maybe depth map or MPI, are going to fit my purpose because I don't really need perfect reconstruction of the scene. I'm only interested in some intermediate representation that just makes uh, or that just looks plausible to human eyes under some manipulation. And in this sense, I think some variations of 2.5D representation will just fit my purpose. Thank you for listening to my talk. If you have uh, any questions or comments, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks a lot, Tissung, for the super exciting talk and the super impressive results. Um, we have time for, for questions. Anybody has some?
Uh, I've got a question. Uh, excellent talk, Tayson. Uh, it's Tim Marks. Um, I was wondering uh, when you separate the style or let's say the texture and the structure codes, what do you use for your losses to make sure that the texture only includes texture and the structure only includes structure? Yes. Uh, by the way, uh, nice to meet you again, team. <laughs> yes, good to see you. <laughs> um, so uh, we basically use two things. Uh, I'm trying to go back to that slide. Sorry, my computer too slow. <laughs> I'm trying to go back. <laughs> So I think your question is, how do I actually enforce this disentanglement of texture and structure, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. We use two things. Uh, first, first step is basically performing swapping to have two independent modular codes to emerge. But of course, there's no guarantee that these two codes will emerge to structure and texture. So to do that, we first use this uh, patch co-occurrence discriminator, which makes sure that this same yellow texture code contains the same uh, type of patch distribution. So any image that's generated from this yellow texture code should produce an image whose image patch is indistinguishable to random patches of the original texture image that produced this yellow texture code. So that is one thing. And then the, the other thing- And that's is, a patchwise discriminator, is that right? Yes, it's patchwise okay. and co-occurrence discriminator in that it actually looks at all these uh, patches together and see if it tries to determine if these patches are from the same image. And then the other thing is a strong inductive bias of our architecture in that the encoder outputs two codes, but they are asymmetric in that one of the code, one of the codes uh, contains spatial resolution and we actually designed that to be the representing the structure part. And on top of that, the receptive field of generating one location of this structure code is actually less than the entire image. And it's just a way to make sure that structure code is not able to capture the overall, the entire distribution of style uh, in the input image. Thank you. Yep. I just I have a follow up question on this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it would be possible with this model? Like, let's say that you have images that overall have some style, but locally they have some small changes in in style, mm -hmm. and you want to like basically reconstruct like keep keep local changes in style. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this kind of structure could be? So easy? yeah, so I think that is an interesting direction. Uh, one way of doing it is when I extract style, I can actually only look at uh, like part of the input image just by simple masking. And our architecture is fully convolutional. So I think all these things are definitely possible. And when generating images, uh, I can use spade type of uh, local modulation instead of global uh, modulation that I'm using in the current model. I think that's definitely interesting. But uh, just for the sake of uh, producing this paper, I thought that was a little bit confusing in that, you know, that then style kind of becomes like structured, right? In that it varies locally. And then it just adds more confusion to a reviewer too. And I'm sure that person is going to complain. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, hi, Tyson. Hi. I just had a simple question. So mm -hmm. given the such a high quality of the generated output in your work, do you think uh, you're going to see sort of more and more people move away from GAN based approaches and, uh, you know, try more of this uh, auto encoder mm -hmm. structure ideas in the future going forward? Do you, do you kind of see that happening or? Um, yes. So for the yes. purpose of image editing, I really don't see why we should uh, be doing unconditional image generation. So I think in that sense, this autoencoder type uh, image editing is much more useful because we don't need to deal with the problem of finding the latent vector that matches the input image. Also, it's much faster, magnitude is faster. So I think this is just uh, more useful. Uh, 
another thing is our method can, I think, achieve a more realistic visual, even more so than unconditional emission ratio models. And that's because the hard part is actually generating the consistent and coherent structure, right? But in our case, structure is actually coming from another image. So it's kind of like cheating, but you know, we can actually bypass the hard problem of generating coherent structure. But speaking, after speaking of all these, my architecture is actually kind of direct adaptation of all the components of StyleGen2. And that's where I'm starting from. So I guess uh, unconditional uh, GAN models are kind of like a very nice benchmark or testing board for just uh, training on nice adversarial uh, metrics. Okay, thank you. I guess I have a quick question. Um, like, were there any interesting like artifacts that you found with the structure, um, just like along the edges or boundaries of like objects? Mm -hmm. I'm curious um, your thoughts on that or what you observed. Uh, by artifacts, do you mean the like tree leaves growing and shrinking towards? Yeah, the or end like of or like this building, for example, that you're showing, mm -hmm. like along the boundaries, does it perfectly match the structure mm -hmm. that you're trying to match? Or yeah, so I think it's actually quite a soft thing. There's no clear answer in that if you look at this part, uh, can you see my pointer, right? So I'm mixing structure of Notre Dame Church and I'm adding in the style of Sagrada Familia here. But then what I'm seeing is because, you know, there are all these like peaky towers in the style image, it also tries to match that as style and produce these images. But if you actually think about it, like the underlying structure has obviously changed it, right? And some people think that this is a desirable thing because like this peaky structure is kind of texture, but at the same time, you know, it's actually not um, uh, entirely uh, respecting the original structure. And because the problem is quite ill-defined, I think the best way is actually enabling the user to control the amount of uh, structure and style trade-off in this case. And I think that can be achieved by maybe at training time, you can actually change the patch size of the patch co-occurrence discriminator to restrain what define what goes into the definition of texture. Another thing is at, at, train, uh, at test time, you can only modulate the later part of your decoder network to allow less room to perform larger manipulation. Um, I've tr briefly tried uh, these things and it seems like they are going to um, work um, in the way that I want them to work. Um, yes, mm -hmm. and I think, yeah, they, these, are, these are interesting directions. Well, thank you. Um, so quick, a quick question, mm -hmm. and you, you might have mentioned it, I don't know. Um, so for if if you you know if you do this this inversion for oops domain um, can sorry still be... uh, your audio dropped out on my side could you repeat oh sorry mm -hmm. oh sorry let me stop my video um so so often oftentimes in um like if, with these with these inversions you observe this funny effect that you can actually regenerate an image that is completely out of domain for the trained generator. Mm -hmm. Right, like image to star again, show show mm -hmm. these things. Um, what happened? What has happens here if you mm -hmm. like if you give it an you know if mm -hmm. you have a church model and you give it a car? Yes, uh, I think I have some results to show that. Okay, oops, my bad. One more second. Let's see. Where is it? Yes, here. So I'm showing two uh, methods that can do this test time optimization to find the correct embedding vector that reproduces the input image. One method is called image to style again, which actually uh, tunes the parameters of each layer activation independently. So it has a very, uh, it's very powerful because it actually, its vector is a very high dimensional vector. So what you see is that 
image to style again actually matches the input image quite well, although a little bit blurrier. But on the other hand, uh, another method proposed by, I think, uh, appendix or toward the end of StyleGen 2 paper is it adds some regularization to make sure that the embedding vector does not fall off the like manifold of the training uh, manifold. And you can see that the reconstruction quality is worse. So in terms of big reconstruction perspective, image to StyleGen seems to be much stronger. And as you said, you can see that even if the model is trained on church images and you're embedding an image of a cat, it is going to do that because you know it, it's actually uh, looking, tuning the individual layer, the layer activations. But then the problem comes at uh, image manipulation time. So image to style again, when performed uh, this swapping of structure and texture by treating structure as the first half of the layer activations, and uh, the later half as uh, style, what you're seeing that the output image just completely falls off the realistic visual manifold. As opposed to that, uh, style again too seems to produce a little bit uh, more realistic images because it adds more regularization. So I think there's trade-off between being able to embed an image and being able to still produce realistic images after doing manipulation in the embedded vector. Okay, thanks. Are there more questions we have? Maybe time for one more question. Okay, uh, well, thanks again, Desun, for the great talk, and it was great having you here. Yep, thank you for coming to my talk. <laughs>